That is the clip that I run anytime it's too rainy to do any photography. That's a clip from about two years ago, but the sky pretty much looks like that around here. Here's a look at our surface chart across the U.S. Very potent weather system moving through Texas today. And you can see all the cold air filtering into the backside of that into west and central Texas. The warm front, that's very easy to pick out. 75 offshore, 74 at Corpus Christi. Decreasing rapidly to the upper 40s in Shreveport. So that puts the front right there along the Gulf Coast. The rest of the U.S. dominated by high pressure, 1041 millibar high across the Yellowstone area and another high 1030 millibars across Kentucky. Now, when we have high pressure in northern Nevada and low pressure along the southern California coast, that can favor Santa Ana winds due to the pressure gradient. However, as we can see here, there's not a whole lot of gusty winds, maybe in Needles, Kingman, and parts of the mountains north of Los Angeles, but overall, the winds are a lot weaker than they could be otherwise. This weather system gives us a good opportunity to take a look at air masses and fronts in isentropic analysis. Look at these conditions we have down around Victoria, Texas. You can see that it's in the low 70s. It's very humid and the winds are out of the southwest. But you go a short distance to the northwest and it's cool northwest winds and dew points are much drier. So if we add the fronts, they're going to look something like this. Notice that we have the incursion of fresh cold air out to the west. We also have the cool, rainy, stagnant, receding polar air, temperatures in the 40s there, and lots of rain and low ceilings. And of course, down to the south, we have the tropical sector. Let's take a look at a couple of soundings. We'll try around Tyler, Texas, around Abilene, and down around Corpus Christi. And there you go. You can see the incursion of warm air northward. So placing our fronts, they're going to be roughly like that. So Tyler, Texas. Looking at that sounding, you can see the frontal inversion right there. And then very deep moisture up above that, extending up to about 15,000 feet. Looking at the Abilene sounding, you can see the very steep laps right there indicating strong modification of the cold air mass. The cold air mass is really reflected in these levels right here where up at about one kilometer, it's below freezing. You can see the strong northwest component right there. And then as you get above that cold air, the top of it's at about 10,000 feet. Above that, you can see we just pick up kind of a westerly flow, kind of hooked up with that upper level jet. And then down to the south around Corpus Christi, basking in that tropical air mass. There's a weak inversion kind of showing up there. That's more of a transition between moderate lapse rates to very strong lapse rates. But the dry air within that layer indicates that there has probably been some subsidence contributing to the warmth up at about 10,000 feet. So that's probably not a frontal inversion. So what would a cross section look like? Let's try a cross section from Corpus Christi through Tyler and maybe up into the cold air. So let's try that. Well, Tropical Tidbits is a pretty useful site for that. So let's see, we're going to go about like that. So here we are, we've got the isentropes, which are in black. That's potential temperature. This is basically the temperature at these levels normalized to near sea level. Actually, 1,000 millibars of pressure, but it's helpful to think of it as the temperature normalized to a common level. Now, of course, the potential temperatures up high in the atmosphere, those are going to be pretty hot. And that's because 
we look at a sounding, even though the temperatures in the stratosphere are cold, we follow that down and we get minus 60 Celsius. If we bring that dry adiabatically down to 1,000 millibars, that's going to be very, very hot. That's off the scale. You're talking about a temperature of maybe 170, 180 degrees Fahrenheit, which is no big deal. But keep in mind that where we see these very hot temperatures, that's an indication that you've got an inversion or you're getting into the stratosphere, which is basically what this is. And normally we expect to find cooler potential temperatures down near the surface. In fact, the coldest isentropic temperature we can find, there's 290, there's 285, there's 280. That's going to be the heart of your cold air right there. And you can see the cold air kind of forms this dome of isentropes. So you can use that dome appearance to kind of identify where the cold air is. Now, air parcels, they like to cling to these black lines, these isentropes. They don't do that when there's diabetic processes going on, like convection or surface heating, evaporation or cooling or stuff like that. But in fair weather, if the winds are blowing, say, from south to north, like if you have low pressure up to the north, they're going to follow these black lines. And you can see what happens is they rise up and over the cold air. That's overrunning. So we're actually able to visualize that. So if we have southerly flow like we do, see that? That's southerly flow for sure. It's going to rise up and over the cold air. You can think of these as blankets. And your air is trapped in between the blankets. And whether it rises or falls depends on which way it's pushed. If it's pushed the other way, obviously it's going to sink. Anyway, we also see the jet overhead. There it is right there. And the jet tends to form where there's pressure gradients down below. Anyway, let's focus on this and look at isentropic lift. Now, obviously, if we take one little isentrope, say 290, we're going to find that it's low down to the south. See, these are latitudes and longitudes way down south. And it rises as you go north into the cold air. So 290, 290 Kelvin. Here's the College of DuPage isentropic maps. There's 290 right there up the top. So we can actually look and see those heights plotted in black. Now the heights are given in pressure. So 1,000 millibars, it's going to be close to the surface. And yeah, we do have 1,000 millibar pressures down near the coast. But you can see that as we go north, the pressures drop. That's because we're getting into higher and higher levels. So pairing this field with the wind plots, we can see that there's isentropic lift as you go north across Texas. The green indicating higher relative humidity, which means that the air is going to saturate very quickly with any lift. And that's what's happening. And I live in this area here, and I've got rain coming down. I can hear it outside. In fact, here's a look at it. And that's the isentropic lift I've been showing you. These hypothetical things that are on the charts, they actually convert to real weather. The upper air chart hinting at a split flow pattern. Strong warm air advection from the Pacific into the Yukon Northwest Territories area. Looks like the pattern may go something like that crossing Hudson Bay. And then we have this cut off circulation down to the south, augmented to a certain extent by the subtropical jet. This is probably a better look at the jet patterns. Yeah, it doesn't look like the jet quite connects across the Hudson Bay region. However, the gradient is certainly there. And then moving forward, this cutoff flow here in Texas looks like that is just an overall very troughy region through the south central U.S. associated with that cold air down in the low levels. Here's another trough. Looks like that is starting to shear out and 
Yep, there's another low right there. In the Great Lakes area, here's another trough. That one is also shearing out, and that low drifts out into the Nevada region. So a lot of breakdown of these waves into closed vortices. So a lot of complex, intricate details over the next one to two weeks, and I would not expect the forecast models to be all that accurate beyond, say, 160, 180 hours. So we're going to focus on the short term with this weather system in Texas. Let's go back to basics. If we look at the thickness, which is the red and blue dashed lines, we can see the thermal gradient right there. There's a little bit of thermal gradient up north. I carried that on the surface analysis as that little minor warm front up north. But the one we want to focus on is down here. So that's going to be the true cold front. And then the warm front itself, that's just south of Houston, out into the Gulf. And then everything north of there is a occlusion. Up to that hybrid, bear clinic, bear tropic low, up in southern Oklahoma. So anyway, now that we have an idea, we've got a developing baroclinic system down there in the Gulf, and that's what we're going to see develop over the next day. Moving forward into tonight, let's see what happens with that. There it is, a low starting to show up there. It's still sort of an open wave, but it continues progressing eastward. So there's the fronts there. And of course, that's going to move up through Alabama, Georgia, and Florida on Saturday and then start heading for the northeast U.S. So those are the fronts there late Friday. A pretty strong cold pool in western Tennessee there. You can see the very strong thermal gradient around Atlanta. So this is starting to gain steam, and you're going to see the pressures decrease from 1007 down to 1003 and 999 millibars. So there's the pattern on early Saturday and most of that is going to be offshore. However, we do expect it to be showery there in New England, New York City. And it looks like the model has backed off just a little bit on the snowfall up in northern Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. And then for the next big change, we're going to set our sights out in this area here. You can see a new system trying to get organized out west. This looks like mostly an upper level, mid-level low. Not really doing much. And then the next wave comes through around the 10th next week. That looks to be pretty potent there. Major central rocky system possible. Although the main thermal gradient is down to the south, so we're going to kind of keep an eye on that area. So that's where I would be looking right there in West Texas. And yeah, you can kind of see it coming together. Lots of cold air stacked up in the Four Corners area. And finally, things come together around the 13th and 14th. And there it goes. Possibly some storms and then maybe a bit of wintry weather from Oklahoma all the way up towards Missouri. But again, this is 288 hours out. This is going to be wildly subject to change. And in fact, I think this looks much different than it did from yesterday's run. So this is a hypothetical could happen scenario but we'll just have to see what the models show next week I've had a couple questions about the Canadian upper air charts just put Canada upper air into Google and that'll take you there the color charts do not exist we create those by post processing the graphics however the monochrome graphics are there for you to use and that'll do it for this edition of Forecast Lab. Thank you for joining, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.